Hi, so I'm Oscar Clark. I'm Chief Strategy Officer at Fundamentally Games. And today I'm going to be talking about how to build a games business model. Uh, and we're going to go in a little bit more detail around uh, exactly how the process works and exactly how kind of you can approach this in a way that hopefully you can then start building your own. And hi, Peter. Um, cool. So let's let's kick off. So you know, why am I doing this? Well, a lot of the work I, I've done previously as a consultant, and I still end up doing a lot of it now, has been about trying to understand what the success looked like. Uh, when I was working in big companies, I had to demonstrate the new features and new experiences in the games platforms I was running, how they would work and how successful they might be. Uh, so I, I learned a lot about doing this from working in uh, telcos, British Telecom and um, Three, the mobile operator. Um, they had some very rigorous processes and approaches, which uh, a lot of my work is built from. Um, obviously, I've done a number of startups, and uh, that's a process where you always have to have something to show your investors what you want to do. And in particular, um, as we help games companies, particularly getting them to work out you know, their live ops potential, we need to understand what that game can do as well. So this process I'm going to talk you through has evolved through lots of different uh, periods. And so we'll kind of take you through that. Please feel free to ask questions as we go along. Obviously, this is a live conversation. Uh, we will record it and we will share the recording and the slides um, for everybody as well. So let's kick off with no further ado. Why are you making a game? This is the first question I want you to ask yourself when it comes to building a business model. The reason is it's quite easy to get sidetracked and to forget what it is you're trying to achieve. And if you don't actually understand what it is that means success for you, it doesn't matter what kind of model you make, it won't be that meaningful. And I think it's important to also pay attention to the other things, the, the things which are not necessarily money, uh, which drive your motivation. So are you trying to communicate ideas? Is it about gameplay? Is it about genre? Uh, is it about innovation? Is it about professional accolade? All of these things matter. Now, they don't particularly necessarily affect the model directly, but they do affect what you're trying to achieve with that model. So understanding why you're doing this in the first place is really important. And the reason I think that's important is because it's understanding what the purpose is of doing a business model in the first place is, because it's actually about understanding what success looks like. This isn't about prediction. This is about understanding where, if you do the things that are appropriate, if you do things that other games have already done, what could your game deliver? That's what we're kind of trying to do. So unless you've you know, seriously considered why you're making a game, it's going to be really hard for you to actually put down on paper, actually put down in sort of it's a selection of competitor games and profiles, exactly what it is that your game is going to achieve and what success can look like. So what is the model? Now, there are lots of terms. Is it a financial model? Is it a business model? Um, you know, I am basically talking about a spreadsheet. Um, I'm going to quickly switch my share screen uh, and across so you can see mine. Um, this is a spreadsheet. Here it is, it's my business model. I've got year one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Uh, I've got, you know, months across the line where I've calculated out the amounts of money, downloads and so on and so forth. Now you will notice on this model, I've not included a budget. I'm not gonna cover budgeting in this talk. This is purely about what it takes, you know, to, you know what revenue models we're likely to get. Um, now that's mostly because of time. I can't, I can't fit everything into kind of a very short webinar. Um, but we have put in here a little bit of cost, particularly the cost of acquisition. So we've done some estimates in terms of how you, uh, you know, how much money you need to accommodate, how much it will cost you for the user base that you're going to get. What I do want to draw your attention to here is, of course, you know, the games. So we're going to be showing you some game data of various kinds, um, source games that we're using. <coughs> I'm going to show you a portfolio, uh, how we're going to show a portfolio of games. And this is how we're going to derive what we think our game is going to be like. Now, I'll come into that a little bit later, but I just wanted to show you that what I'm, what I'm talking about here is actually trying to abstract what is essentially 
a spreadsheet. Maybe that will make sense. <laughs> so the bottom line I want to take, you to take away with this is we're building a spreadsheet, which is a representation of what our game can achieve, what success can look like for us. And we're going to do it based on real data. Now, if we have data for our own game, we must use it. But if we don't yet have data for our game, which is often the case, particularly when you're working with an investor or a publisher, you've got to have some data to base that on. And we're going to talk about how we find that data and how we populate the business model to then make that something which is a reasonable facsimile, facsimile even, of what a success can look like for us. So who's it for? I think a business model is for you. The business model is for the, the company, the game teams, to actually get in the heads what the scale of opportunity that they're working towards looks like. Yes, it's a tool we can share information with investors. Yes, it's a tool we can share with publishers, other parties, whatever it might be. But at the heart of it, I think it's a really important stage that we as a, as a team need to make to really understand what it is we're trying to achieve with the work we're trying to do. So being very careful about that first. And then once you're comfortable, you understand it, you can live and breathe it, then you can start communicating what that looks like to other people. So. A business model is really a kind of financial kind of line in the sand that allows you to say, this is what success looks like for me. Then you can gauge what activities are reasonable and appropriate for you to put in. How much commitment, how much time, how much costs are appropriate for you to put into that game? Well, unless you know what you can get back from it, you shouldn't really even be starting, you could argue. So what should it show? Well, obviously you want to see what profit, great. And also loss, obviously that's another side of it, but it's the profit and loss and risk over time. It's the ability for you to understand what your cash flow could be, how much cash, how much run rate do you need in order to get to the stage where your business, your games business can be successful? How does it fit into the other projects you're working on? So it's a really kind of important thing. And obviously every person making a model is going to have slightly different considerations. A lot of the models I do are individual games only. That's why in this example, we don't have budgets and costs. And this is why in this example, uh, it's actually designed specifically for people, uh, it was actually done for a, a team of doing an investment. And they wanted to know for that game in isolation, what the game could generate. That was that specific requirement. So you're going to have similar kind of uh, constraints and desires to achieve with your model. But essentially, we're trying to work out what the revenue could look like. So let's get into that. Let's get into the meat of it. What are we doing first? Well, first, we need to understand what our game proposition is. And it's not your genre. It's not just max three games. Here's an, three examples of max three games. Uh, we must, you know, you, you must build a boat. Um, Candy Crush and uh, Puzzle and Dragons. Now, obviously they're quite old examples, but I'm old, so I, I like to use old examples. They're nice and clean though. They're, they're examples that a lot of people will understand. Humans Build a Boat is not the same game as Candy Crush, but it is the same mechanic. Should you be comparing your success making a game like You Must Build a Boat with Candy Crush? Should Candy Crush be in your model? Well, probably not. Probably Candy Crush's success level is so far above what you're trying to do. And actually, its audience is so different. The social layer, the comparison, the saga system, all of these processes, the replayability, the intrinsic free-to-play monetization, all set Candy Crush aside in terms of the audience profile, the proposition that that game represents. Then we Puzzles and Dragons. Puzzles and Dragons is a fascinating experience, all about you know, the gacha process and upgrading your monsters and getting collections on seasonality. You know, it's an incredibly different proposition focused around much more short-term goals than Candy Crush, which is a much more relaxed, sedentary kind of game, I would argue. It's a game that you pull out when you're going on a flight. It's a game that you pull out when you're on a train journey. It's something that you pull out when you're taking time out for yourself. It's not something that creates huge demands on you. So understanding the differences in proposition that go deeper than genre is really going to be key to you being able to successfully model what your game is going to be like. 
So next thing, I think, to help you do that, to help you look at the differences, I look at the layers. So what I mean by game layers are mechanic, context, and meta game. Mechanic is the things that we do, the how we play. So that's the start condition, the challenge, the resolution. Of so what do we actually do in the process of play? That's three games, we move a gem, we create a line, next, you know, that line disappears, next stuff happens, done. But why we play the game is the context. So the sense of purpose and progression for you must build a boat is very different from the sense of purpose and progression for Candy Crush. And similarly, very different from that of Puzzles and Dragons. So understanding the sense of purpose and progression, as well as the way the gameplay economy works, and by economy, I don't necessarily mean I buy and sell resources. By economy, I mean the balancing, the, the way you need certain actions and behaviours in order to unlock other actions and behaviours. Um, I could get into lots of detail about why hot dog, and it's all to do with imbalance. I, I love imbalanced economies in games. I think they're really important for keeping uh, sustained audiences. But that's not what this talk is about. Um, so we also think about narrative in this context layer. Because narrative is also part of the process because you're telling a story whether it's a real story a real narrative you know epic tale um or if it's actually simply just the player experience relation you know related to them so Petrus has a story it's not a very deep story it's very kind of abstract uh, there are lots of uh, objects that are coming down from the sky i have got to place them i'm going to get gaps and every once in a while i'm going to clear a line there's a dramatic success a bit of relief and now i've got to keep going but I'm going to face inevitable doom. Okay, that may not be the most riveting of stories, but it is a personal narrative that I'm currently enjoying when I'm playing that game. Teasing, anticipation, why we play again, again, part of the context loop. So if you understand what it is that makes the layer of context for your game work, you're going to have a bit more insight on how you can find other games like that game, like your game. And metagame for me are the things that are not the game. They are things like the social collaboration, the lifestyle fit, the mode of use, and the way that the physicality of the device impacts the way we consume the content on that device. Like if I play on a console, my experiences can be different from that on a PC. Uh, if I play on a phone, I'm probably on the toilet or I'm waiting for a bus or something. I mean, okay, maybe not quite, but that immediacy of use is very different from any of those others. Switch, again, a different way of playing. Uh, yes, I can be playing on my Switch in a, on a bus, but it's not the same kind of experience as when I'm, you know, the throwaway moment of a mobile device. Understanding the cultural zeitgeist as well. All of these things really affect the way that games play in ways that are subtle and not necessarily obvious. So breaking your game down, understanding what it is in terms of proposition in these layered ways can really help you. And I then go a little bit further with this. So what I then look at are personas. So for each of those three layers, I'm trying to find out an audience. Now I choose three personas because I've got three layers and it also is really useful to think about scale. With any project, product, game, whatever, we need to know who we're making it for. By breaking it into three personas, we can think about a core audience, the primary persona, in this case, Ahmed, who's uh, a 24-year-old RT support, self-confessed gamer who thinks that he could be an esports player, who feels that he can't let his mates down if he doesn't turn up and play, so he has to play. He does play every day. He says the game needs more than whatever, whatever it is. This is just an example, obviously. Um, he's a C1, C2, D. Now, this is a uh, UK-specific marketing language. C1, C2, D, that, that means that he's either works with brain, works with hands, or... Uh, not working. That, that, that's kind of what those things are. These are household demographic uh, pieces. You may have different models you want to use. These are ones which are great shorthand for me. You'll notice I've made that up. Can you make up an audience? Well, because this is a hypothesis. As soon as we know who's really playing the game, we replace this with the real data. But in the absence of that data, we make our hypothesis and we can test it. So if we know who's going to be doing the mechanic, who is going to be the personality that we're going to be targeting when we make the context loop, and who's the personality we're looking for 
when we were doing the, uh, the meta game loop, now we've got three personalities that allows us to think about the core audience, how we can retain that audience, and then how we can scale that audience. We've got three different types of personality. Now, this is a process we use for marketing as well, but I find it very useful. So I understand who is going to play this game. And that's going to make it a lot easier for me to work out what other games are actually filling the same gap that the game I'm making is filling. Does that make sense? I'm hoping it does. Obviously, please feel free to uh, ping me, uh, ping the chat if you, uh, uh, if you have any questions or thoughts. So I'm showing you here a, a slide, um, which is basically just a screen grab from the Game Refinery. Uh, that's just one example. Oh, there are other platforms out there, App Annie, Aptopia, whatever. Uh, I particularly like using um, the power score in um, uh, Game Refinery's tool because it allows me to get a little bit more information about how many additional playable elements there are in a game. It's easier to compare games with these characteristics that I've been talking about. So we're trying to find games that look like our game, but not just in terms of the surface area, as I said, not just the genre, but that deliver the proposition and that deliver an experience to the audiences that I've identified. So I know what my proposition is. I know what my audience is in some detail. I'm now going to search on characteristics that allow me to identify games that meet those characteristics. And that it's really just a way of getting a a short list, rather than looking through the millions of games that are actually out there. Now, bear, bear in mind, I'm using, I'm using mobile here as an example. I'll talk about PC later, but it's very similar principle. But it's actually a little easier on mobile because we can get these kind of lists. In this case, I've got the top, um, uh, I think it's top 200 or is it top 500? No, top 500 ranking and then top 1,000 um, revenue or the other round, I'm not too sure which round. Um, then that's given me a selection of games. I can look at each of those games and I can say, yeah, that fits, that doesn't fit, that fits, that doesn't fit. I've already short listed that process by putting in the characteristics in my search criteria. That means I can find hopefully 10 games. Now I'm looking for 10 games because that's a convenient number. I want to have enough games in my model to be able to have the averages meaningful. I want those 10 games to be spread generally around, uh, along the axis of revenue. Uh, and I don't want just them clustered at the top. I want to spread them between the top 10, the top 50, top 200, top 300, 500. I want to spread them all the way across that as broadly as possible. It's better to have a blend that's broadly uh, listed than it is to have them clustered. If you cluster them, you're going to make your model too subjective. Now, this is not easy to do. It takes time and practice, but essentially you should be able to find a range of games that give you indicative numbers that you can justify. And actually, that's what this is about. Because you know why you're making the game, because you know what the proposition is, because you know who the audience is, you can now justify your selection of 10 games. So having done that, we now have to do something with them. That's go get the data. So this is an example, Candy Crush. Uh, I'm using Reflections here, again, owned by uh, the um, Game Refinery folks. Actually, no, now, uh, by Vungle. Vungle just acquired uh, Game Refinery. Um, no, that was only um, And so here you can see that you've got uh, revenue and downloads. That's data that you can access. Now, I've, I actually pay for Reflection. Uh, if you don't pay, you just get ranking. Ranking's really hard to work from. But if you can get the real data, uh, and again, the reason why I went for reflection is I think it's something like 200 pound a month rather than two, you know, rather than a thousand pound a month. I think the app is of this world are more expensive, but don't take my word for it. Go find out for yourself. Uh, you want to make sure you've got data you can afford to use. Um, but remember when you're using external data, it's only as good as their assumptions. They do, they do not have actual download data for every game. They don't have revenue data for every game. What they have is ranking and a subset of those games. And they're inferring based on the real data they've got from the games that are hooked into their systems, what every rank means in terms of revenue and downloads. So that's kind of the way that it works. 
Again, that's okay. As long as you know that, as long as you are paying attention and you're communicating that when you're communicating, communicating your model, this is not a absolute science. This is about getting the best information we can and making the best assumptions we can. Um, as I say, we don't just do um, mobile games. We also look at uh, PC games. In this case, we're looking at Steam. Uh, again, I talked about you must build a boat. So here's the data for you, you must build a boat. Um, you can get this on Steam Spy. Uh, actually, the nice thing about Steam Spy is you can sign up to their Patreon account. You know, if you, if you sign up as a Patreon account for them, you get the actual data downloads. Uh, it's not very expensive. Uh, I think it's actually about a year or something. It's really, really quite reasonable. Um, so definitely what suggest doing that if you're a PC person. There isn't anything equivalent that I'm aware of that covers off console games. Uh, however, what I try to do when I'm looking at console is I work, you know, I talk to lots of my friends who work in the space and try to get a gauge of what the respective differences between their Steam data and their other platforms. And of course, that's not just Steam. There's now the Epic Store. There are other stores out there. Uh, there are direct sales. Um, and of course, there's console and Switch. Um, so again, we don't have data for those other platforms. We have to make assumptions. And to be honest, I quite like not including those assumptions, which means that as long as I know I can generate a decent revenue from my game, anything I do on other platforms is a bonus and therefore my investors are happy with what I get. So we've now got Steam Spy data for PC games. We've got um, reflection or other platform data for mobile games. What does that look like? I remember my spreadsheet. This is taken from my spreadsheet. This happens to be Pokemon Go in this particular example. So I've got the iOS data on the left-hand side. I've got the, um, the, the, the Android data on the right-hand side. That easy, in there. What you will notice, hopefully, is that it's listed from the first date of available data down. It's not a specific day. It's the first date. The reason is I want to align all of the data I've got from day one of their release to the current available data. That's important because what we're trying to work out, what is the average adoption curve for each of those games? I'm interested in the curve. I'm not interested in the specific number. Well, I am, but I'm less interested in the specific number. I'm more interested in the rate of change. It's a big thing for me. Rate of change really matters. So. What we're trying to do is get the data from the first date of available data for each of those games. And then we've got 10 of them lined up in our spreadsheet. We can then pull them together and make some assumptions. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Hopefully everyone's with me. Uh, so let's have a look at what it looks like from a PC point of view. Uh, so the PC one looks a bit like this. So, um, oh, he says, no, I'm, oh, let me do the PC one. First. So this is the PC one. So on the PC one, you'll see here, um, you've got, oh, actually, that's not true. Let me, let me switch back. Um, there we go, this is the PC one. Right, so on the PC one, you can see here, the data looks slightly different. So Steam data is a little bit weirder, a little bit different. To, um, now you do get the price. Important thing to note here is you've got the price on that day. Too many games models on PC assume the base price of the game applies to every transaction. It does not. Steam is driven by sales. You need to make sure you're paying attention to the actual price on the day that the purchases were made. Now, you'll also see that Steam has owners, not how many people that day. Unfortunately, that means that number can go up and down. That's a real problem for building PC game models. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that works and the difficulty of that in a bit. But again, same principle applies. We want the first available date of data all the way down because we're looking at the curve of adoption. I usually separate PC games from mobile games. I try not to cross the streams. Lots of reasons, but basically they're just it's just too different and you're gonna get really bad assumptions if you try and do PC and mobile on the same um, uh, business model. Okay, um, so that's basically kind of the data side. So let's talk about how we consolidate that data. And here, average A is your friend. So what we're doing is basically our top line here, IS revenue, 
that has a statement in it, average A. So I'm taking an average of all of those 10 games. But I'm, it's called average A because I don't want it to go wrong if I get to the end of the year, if I get to the end of the release date of that particular game, and it's got zero in it. So if it's got a zero, average A will ignore it when it averages. And that's really important because you want to build a sustainable model. And it's also particularly important because I'm, I'm not always going to include every game. I'm sometimes going to have scenarios where I have subsets of the 10 games so that I can see what different um, scenarios look like. So average A, very, very important. If you've not used it in a uh, spreadsheet before, just go look at it. Uh, there's plenty of online help that shows you what average A does. Uh, next up, um, we're going to talk about um, the theme problem. Again, so as I said before, one of the issues is that we have to calculate not just what the current owners are, but what the change in owners is, because that's what you're going to need to be able to build a business model. You need to know what that change is, because you need to know what revenue you're generating in a period. Then you get this, a minus. Now, I actually do two things, two different things. I have scenario one, where I treat the minus as an actual loss. Now, it's not technically a loss because it's not, this, is, this isn't representative just of refund, although it can be. It's more a representation of the way Steam Spy calculates free access to a game. So it's kind of a retrospective um, reworking, if that makes sense. But that, that means you end up with these kind of odd things here where you've got, oops, you've got this kind of minus revenue in certain months, which is very scary and looks weird. And when your investors see it, they go, what the hell? Um, so this is one of the things that I haven't got a good answer to. And like I said, I'll do two scenarios. One where I treat the zero, the minus as a zero, as a minus, sorry, as, a, as a actual loss. The other one where I treat it as a zero. Uh, and that tends to be, the result in the reality will be somewhere between the two. Uh, you you know you won't get as good a model as in general as you take a where you've got the minus treated as zero, and you won't generally get as bad a model as when you treat the the model as a as a negative. I sound, probably sounds a bit confusing, but hopefully I've expressed the issues with Steam data, and that we don't um, you know have a really good answer for it. Uh, so. Becky is saying, so the minus represents the end of a free weekend promotion. Exactly. But unfortunately, it doesn't happen at the end of the weekend promotion. It happens like two months later, three months later, which is why it's really hard to attribute back to a specific event. Steam spy data seems to trigger that uh, change for a number of reasons, and that is one of them. Cool. So uh, again, that's where if any of you guys have got more information about that than I have, I would love to collaborate on that. I think this is one of the bigger problems we've got in terms of building PC game models. But I want to make sure that you guys know that it's an evolving feast. Um, so again, the thing to remember here is remember you're building the model for you. Remember that you have to understand the assumptions that you make and you have to be able to defend them. The investors are more interested in knowing that you know your business than they are necessarily on the actual numbers themselves. They want the numbers to be good. Don't get me wrong. They want the numbers to be robust, but they only know the numbers are robust if you can defend them. And you're going to spend more time defending them than you will actually design the, the, the model itself. So now, just thinking back to our, our, our spreadsheet, we've done our individual game tabs, we've created a portfolio tab, and we've got a list of um, the averages of all of the games on that tab, uh, all consolidated by day, and then we can turn that into by month. Now, scenarios. I said, I said I wanted to do scenarios. What I mean by scenarios, basically, which selection of games are we going to have? So I'm actually gonna switch out to the uh, spreadsheet again to show you what I mean by this. Um, so here is our spreadsheet. Uh, he says, so here is our spreadsheet. Um, and on our spreadsheet, this is the scenario bit I was talking about. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, 
in this scenario, I've got scenario two, and that is showing me at one, game two, well, so a subsection of the games I've selected. In this particular example, I've got 12 two apps and um, 10 games, because this particular example is a location-based game thing, and it was a model that was built around that idea. Uh, and it was there was a good comparison for audiences who were interested in particular apps to be interested in a particular game. So what I'm doing here is if I change this number here, so I change that to say three, you can see now a whole different list of those games I've selected are now shown. If I change that to one, you can see now a different list, a more positive list is shown. So that's just sort of give you a sense of, you know, how we can use scenarios. And you will have seen as I did those changes that the numbers changed as well because uh, and again, I'm going to switch back to the slides now because it's slightly easier to read on the slide. This equation is what's on each one of those boxes. And it's horrendous to look at. I know, don't get me wrong. But what it's saying is, is that it's using clustered if statements. I love clustered if statements. They do take a lot of debugging, a lot of testing, but they're worth it if you can pull them off. So in this case, I'm saying if game A is a yes, then we're going to show the data from game A. If game, if app one is, is in the list, then we're going to show. So then when I change this scenario list, the data changes accordingly. So I can change one thing and the whole scenario rolls out. It's like magic. Uh, it's not, it takes a lot of work, but it, it, it's, once you've got that working, it makes life so much easier to actually run scenarios for you. So, what we'll do is we'll, we'll come think about what that then means. So we've built, we've built a bunch of scenarios. Now we're going to turn that, add all that, all those numbers up. But before we can add all those numbers up, we've got to do something else. Yes, I know it's a long list of things to do, but hopefully it all makes sense. So we're going to come up with some assumptions. These are some examples of assumptions I use a lot. Uh, I don't necessarily use them in every scenario, but DAO versus MAO, so daily active users divided by monthly active users is a useful thing to calculate particularly useful if you're adding a um, ad based model to a market that hasn't used ads before because i'll typically work out an average number, you know, proportion of uses of ads per day it's a much more useful way to calculate so you want to know what the daily active user number would be and it's not as clear cut as a just oh let me this number um if you've got a certain number of downloads how do you convert that into how it's going to be well you need the down now and you need retention in fact actually the way i calculate now for most of these games is i look at how many people have installed and i add my six percent retention from the previous period that is my amount um and that's not far off uh it's a rule of thumb that is not clear science to it but i've done lots and lots of different examples of this where i've tracked it back to real data and again remember when you've got real data, replace the assumptions. Now I've got basically a, a good estimate of what that percentage should be. I'm arbitrarily saying what the percentage organic installs are going to be. Now that's a very arbitrary number. Every game is going to be different. Some games are 98% ad funded. So you only get the install if you've advertised to that person. Others are 98% organic. Uh, by organic, I mean people who find the game naturally or who basically discover the game from the app store through app store optimization or through other website material. Maybe even through an influencer who suddenly started talking about you. Things which aren't traceable in the same way that a, a direct ad or a direct paid install can be done. Um, that then allows you to work out what your cost of, ins of your installs are going to be. But of course, you've got to make some assumptions. Well, that's going to cost you. You've also got to make some assumptions if you're using ad revenue in your game, what that looks like. So there's a whole bunch of questions around that. And I also think it's quite useful to have a sense of what your average revenue per daily active user is, because whilst you can calculate it, it's quite a good indicator. If you can get something in a mobile game, this is, you can get something like, you know, five to 10 pence, or sorry, five cents pence um, for your mobile game, you're probably not far off a, a, a reasonable number. If it goes too far beyond that, you might have something wrong in your equations. Just worth bearing that in mind. Okay, always remember to currency convert. And it's something I've made a mistake on so many times and I have to kick myself and remember that all of the data I'm getting is in dollars. 
but I'm dealing with pounds with investors. And it's too easy to switch between pound and dollar. So you have to make a decision. So I put everything in dollars until I get to the front page, the business model page, and I make that pounds. That's because we use pounds. Uh, if I could make everything dollars, I would, but the investors we talk to generally want to see pounds. Um, then I've got to think about VAT. Now, technically, I should be putting different VAT for each territory the games are available at. Now, because I'm taking data primarily from the US audience, uh, because I, it's too complicated to try and do everything else, and the US is such a large proportion of those audiences, um, I tend to just put 20% as a blanket. And it's definitely kind of a good average to put in there. Uh, but you may want to have better numbers. You, you make the assumptions for yourselves. As long as you communicate to your investor, to people who are reading the slides, why you've done it, they will be confident that you've got a systematic approach. Uh, retention, even if I can't spell it right. Um, and then um, CPI, things like that we talked about. So these are just examples of the kinds of assumptions that I'll put in. Again, just to remind you, if you have any real data, replace the hypothesis. You know, it's always about keeping this as a living document. It's about you having information about how your business is likely to do, and that is the most important use of a business model, a financial model, whatever you want to call it. Let me add everything up. So pretty much what it says on the tin. So we're going to add up all the total downloads. We're going to calculate what our total, total monthly active users are. We're going to work out what our uh, in-app purchase and ad revenue are based upon those assumptions. We're going to know what our total revenue is. Now, obviously, with the way we've calculated this, we've probably estimated our total revenue from the averages already, and then we've worked back. So, um, you know, that, that works out. Then, of course, we've got other pieces in there. So we've got things like remembering. Again, another thing that's important to remember, that your platform fees only come off your in-app purchase revenue, not your ad revenue. It's so easy to forget that. Um, because you just want to get the spreadsheet out of the way and done, you have to stop and remember, okay, where am I actually calculating losses and, and, and gains? You, then you can work out what your cumulative uh, cash flow is. Um, I haven't done it in this model, but one, what we often have to do is remembering that it takes time for you to get paid the money that's attributed to you. So you might have a player um, paying for in-app purchases on month one, but not get that until 45, 60, 90 days later. So it's important as part of the business model, as part of communicating the robustness of your understanding of the commercial realities of your game, that you take into account the time frame between when you have to pay your costs and when you are going to get your revenues. So that's, that sort of factoring is really important. So we've added everything up. We now have to do the most important thing, the single most important time-consuming thing there is, check, double check, triple check. I strongly recommend the thing that I do very little of and I know I should, which is put in two different ways of calculating the same numbers and make sure they add up. I know it sounds weird, but unless you know that the two different numbers that add up, you don't know there's not a hidden problem in your spreadsheet. It's so easy to miss things. I also find it really useful to use the wonderful feature in Excel, which is the trace precedence or trace dependence. Uh, I, I hopefully you, uh, if you, those of you who've used spreadsheets extensively, they will already be your friends. Uh, but if you haven't uh, looked at that already, definitely check it out. It's very easy. Just like a, look at the formulas, um, price precedence, price dependence. You get these lovely arrows so you can see all of the calculations and how they fit together. Really, really important. Now, one thing that's not great is where you're referencing data from other sheets. It doesn't really give you a good visual way to do that, but it's still better than nothing. So checking, double checking, triple checking, make sure that you actually do know the numbers are there. And some of the other things that you can do, like I mentioned before, look at the ratio of ad revenue, IP revenue. Is it actually meeting the assumption you made? Look at the ARP down, so average revenue per daily active user. What is the ARPU? You know, what is the average revenue per user at all over that monthly period? What is the average revenue per paying user? 
you know, these kind of things, you can probably make assumptions and calculates, and then you can say, does that feel right? Um, again, a lot of it comes down to, does it feel right? Which is not a, the best answer you want to be able you know, tell an investor. But at the end of the day, that's probably what's going on. The important thing is, can you justify it? Can you have confidence in why you've made that assumption? So again, remember, you notice that this is the third time I'm saying it, check, double check, triple check. Now, do you do a three year or a five year forecast? Now, uh, because we're in the UK, uh, because a lot of the teams we're working with have to deal with the HMRC, which is the tax authority in the UK, uh, we have to have a five year plan for certain uh, tax uh, benefited investment processes. Uh, I don't know why I've cut off year one on this sheet, but hey. Um, so we don't have a crystal ball, we can't just guess, um, but if we have a five year plan, we do it of best endeavors. No one actually expects your business to match these numbers at all, but they should be indicative of how much you know your business and how likely you will be to be successful if you do as well as the other games that you have selected. So it, it gives you a solid basis to say, I do understand my game. This is what games like this have done. This is what success could look like. So not a prediction, but a really good kind of understanding. Three-year plans are much more justifiable. Five-year plans, a little bit more tenuous, but we do them anyway. And I think it's actually not a bad thing for you as a business to do because you should be looking in the long term. It's probably going to take you a year, two years to get the game to a point where you can actually release it. It depends on the game, obviously, and the scale of it. Hyper casual games are a lot quicker. Big, you know, triple A console plat, you know, console living experiences are a lot longer, possibly. So it's not a bad thing to think about the time frame of your development and how that affects your choice about the time frame of your business plan. So hopefully from that you've got that a business model is basically a living tool. It's not just a financial model. It's not a prediction. It's an estimation of what success can look like. It's a way of being able to say to your investors and your partners and your teams, this is what we're aiming for. It allows you to set the scale of your expectations and set the scale of the costs that you are willing to incur to offset against the risk of that risk delivery. By using scenarios, we can be smart and see what the various risks are. One of the things we often do, particularly when we're doing these models for investors, is we try to see what the difference is between the high performing scenario and the low performing scenario. And if there is a big drop off between the high performing and middle performing, but the difference between the middle performing and the low performing scenarios isn't that great, then we are pretty confident that that particular marketplace has some heavy hitters that are probably overpowering that market. So our expectations should be probably more, you know, managed. Arnold, thank you for coming. Uh, hopefully uh, that was useful. We'll send you the slides as well. Uh, right, so keeping that mindset, keeping those, those, those um, predictions in, in check, that they're not predictions, that they're actually just ways of understanding our business and what we're trying to do, that should hopefully keep you a little bit sane. Um, and also, because you're replacing all the data as you go along with real information, you're going to get more confident, more understanding, more realistic, and possibly even to the point where you're actually getting close to achievable targets. Um, I put this slide in as well because I think it's a, an important reminder. Um, the reason we focus on living games is because what we're looking to do is not just get that initial peak and drop. We want to re-engage users and sustain them over time. This is what is important, I think, to get a five-year plan um, for an individual game is to make sure you've got a living experience. Um, not every game will be that. Some games you're going to require to be part of a portfolio. But again, think about the life cycle that's appropriate for your game when you're looking at the data. And that should be an important part of the selection of the games that you're using to draw your data. Cool. Um, so I'll, I'm going to switch over to the spreadsheet again to talk to, through that and I'll answer any questions as we go along. Uh, but um, in the meantime, I just want to make sure that you are aware that we're also uh, offering a few things. So uh, obviously, as a business, we help teams with live operations. Um, we're actually doing a free game review for games. So if you've got a game you want to have somebody take an eye over, what we're doing is we look at market fit. 
uh, we're looking at the game mechanic, uh, we can look at retention design and also monetization design. What we'll do is we give um, you know actionable uh, recommendations, which you can just go and use regardless. But obviously, if you think they're useful and you want us to do more, we can tell you a little bit more about what we could do to help there as well, assuming there is some. And actually, for the games we take on, we often do build a business model for that game as it happens anyway, because we need to know what we think the game can achieve as well. We've also got an events calendar, a list of finances. So if you're trying to find investors for your game, there's a whole list of uh, potential people which we keep up to date and the knowledge base of all sorts of articles and webinars like this. So obviously feel free to go look at that. So basically any questions, and I'm going to switch now back to the spreadsheet and see if, you know, just to sort of talk you through that just one last time, uh, just to sort of give you a sense of what, what that spreadsheet looks like. So again, remember I've got these different games. Again, here's Pokemon Go. As I say, here's the first date. And that goes all the way down. I think this one actually goes to, I can't tell what date that is because it's changed format. <laughs> That's funny. Um, but anyway, you've got the kind of sensor. Uh, you've got all of the huge amounts of data there that's that's available. So, you know, thousands of days of data. Um, and then obviously you've got that for Android as well. Um, we did that for all of these different games. In this particular case, it was mostly um, location-based games. And then we pull that together on our portfolio page. We average that out. That is that, that formula I showed you. Um, and then essentially we pull in this, this scenario. So that gives us this business model, which has all those data in. So this is the reason for the scenarios. I can type one here and it's now changed. So this is what the, the if we get everything right, if we make a new Pokemon Go, that's how much revenue we think this game could make. Uh, if we do slightly differently, that's the revenue. If we do slightly differently still, that's the revenue. So within just by pressing one key, I get these different scenarios that give me better understanding of what's going on, where and how, so I can really understand what's going on for that game. Okay, so I mean that's basically it. Um, sadly, I'm not. I can't give you the spreadsheet, unfortunately, because that was created for somebody else, um, and also it's got all our secret sauce in it. But hopefully, from the descriptions we've given you, you should be able to have a good go at how you want to make your own sheet and how you can use data in a similar way to us. We've kind of given you most of the secret sauce. We've given you the keys, but not the uh, not the door, if that makes sense. So. Um, Cool. Does anyone have any questions? Be useful to know if that was true. <laughs> not sure if people are typing or not. It's hard to tell with these things when I because you don't have the voice going on. Um, cool. Um, yeah, I know it'd be great to give you the spreadsheet, but then you'd have, you'd have no reason to uh, to use the scroll thing. So <laughs> not true. Um, so I'll basically uh, send you guys all the recording. Uh, I'll also be sending you the slides themselves. Um, I, I'm very happy to answer questions, so feel free to reach out to us. And again, as I say, if you've got a game, um, I think, yeah, absolutely great. Um, then that should be all, all pretty good. Yeah, curve of adoption, that's a really important thing. And, and we the, the, the trick that we've got here um, is that we don't have to guess what the curve should be. Because we're using real data by the day, and we're comparing day one of each game with day one of all the other games, the average curve is a great representation of what the performance of that game will be. So you don't have to take my word what the curve should be. You can look at real data and see how that's adopted. What we don't know is how much money that game spent each of those games spent individually so we have to make assumptions that's why we look at things like percentage of organic and then we build into the model a cost for paying for those paid users so by having that curve that comes naturally out of the data by having an understanding of what percentage of the average game we're expecting to be organic installs and by including a line item which is how much we expect to spend on acquiring those paid users, now we have a curve that we can justify. So, 
So hopefully that will make sense. Um, Becky's saying it's helped to uh, realize going about uh, looking at similar games the wrong way. Uh, you're looking at games in the same genre as the team's game instead of the game same proposition. Absolutely, that's the, exactly the key thing, uh, Becky. So <laughs> one of the things I think really is a hard thing to get across is it's so easy to just assume that genres are the same thing, but actually genres are terrible. Um, having run lots of platforms and trying to work out what genre selections to use, it's really appalling trying to gauge which game fits into which genre. Um, and I hope that those examples of um, you know match three games show you just how different that is. And the reality is, as you quite rightly highlighted, it doesn't matter what the game is like from a designer point of view. What matters is what the game is from a player point of view. Because at the end of the day, our installs are going to be based on the audience, not on how the game was designed. Um, so, uh, Deborah, great, glad you found that useful. And uh, Peter, I'm glad that thing sort of made sense. Um, does anyone have any other thoughts or questions? And uh, like I say in the survey, it'd be really useful to find out from you guys if there's ways that we can make a thing like this more useful. I'm very aware that I'm shoving a lot of information through a PowerPoint and not able to give you a spreadsheet to play with. Lots of reasons for that. Um, but it'd be interesting to see if that if we manage to pull off giving you enough information that you can work with, um, or if that would require a different technique like next time, because it's slightly different than our usual process. Uh, so Amar saying thanks, that was helpful. Uh, came into this with very little knowledge about what a business model was, so probably had uh, more questions once we get going through the recording and try the slides. Yeah, of course, and um, obviously please feel free to do that. Great stuff. Uh, so uh, Becky's saying, um, yeah, so Becky was asking about data sources uh, for uh, consoles. There isn't, to my knowledge, any game refinery or Steam Spy. Now, there was Chart Track once upon a time. I, I think it's gone now, but I'm not too sure. Chart Track was for physical distribution in the UK. I think they did Europe at one point as well but I haven't found a replacement of that. Um, now, there may be some console publishers out there who know what that is. Um, there are teams like GFK uh, who do this kind of sales data. I think they bought Cartrack. Um, I don't know if they still do it, but the big consumer data companies charge huge amounts of money. So the reason why I don't know is probably because I'm not willing to spend tens of thousands on getting data um you know when i'm going to be using it as one off for a particular project yeah i think jamie you're right a dummy spreadsheet would have been useful the trouble is if i do a dummy spreadsheet then i've kind of yeah there's a lot of issues with that it's like where do you draw the line about what's dummy or not but uh, i did think about that but you're you're it's a good question I'll, I'll think on more but it's good good feedback thank you cool yeah so um you know whether it's game refinery whether it's steam spy obviously find the provider um that you know you're comfortable with and um, there are a few people trying to set up a different platforms uh, i have a friend of mine who's working on a steam spy equivalent uh, and i'm really excited if eric pulls it off um, because of some of the things he's trying to do with it so uh, i'll be uh, very much championing that and shouting about it if it does come off the way he thinks um yes and exactly right becky if we, we need somebody to create one that's affordable uh, the trouble is that if you look at things like App Annie and Apptopia, they're basically building apps for the companies that can afford it at scale. They're building it for the EAs, for the Ubisoft, for the uh, Tencents. They're not building it for indies. The reason is they can get tens of thousands of pounds out of these big companies. They can get millions in total from all of the big companies. So why would they make it for indies? Because they would be basically cutting their nose off. Um, you know, they'd be getting less revenue by making it more accessible. So I don't blame them, not entirely, <laughs> but I am frustrated that that's the ecosystem that we're in. You know, if only, you know, companies like Apple and um, Android, actually, you know, Google just decided to give the data away. Um, then again, I think that's probably value that they probably wouldn't want to give away anyway. 
Okay, so unless anyone's got any other questions, um, oh, okay, uh, BG charts, any good for constant sales data? Um, I haven't used it, so I wouldn't be able to, ch to tell. Uh, I will happily go check it out and, and try and send you some thoughts. Um, so yeah, definitely very happy to take a look at that. Um, but it's not one I, um, I've, I've looked at. And most of the reason is that when I look at these things generally, it's the ability to export the data that's missing. Um, so there might be good charts saying what general information is, but for what I'm trying to achieve, I need daily downloads um, for a specific game. So um, I don't know if that's feasible on VG charts, but I'll, I'll check those out. But yeah, Mark, thank you. That's also another one. Uh, Jematsu, the Japanese market. Good to know, good to know. Um, what I tend to do for, um, what, so we, I recently did one for um, uh, VR market. And so I was looking at Steam versus Oculus versus uh, PSVR. And there were some really interesting market data on one of the sites. I think it was Artillery, I'm not too sure, A Artillery, um, which had a, uh, a breakdown of, of the total market share over time for those platforms. So I was able to use that um, as a multiplier so that I could have for those VR games on those VR platforms, what each of those would, would offer. Um, so yeah, it's, it's finding the granularity is always the problem. <clears throat> and thankfully, you know, we've got applications like Reflections. Thankfully, we've got applications like Steam Spy. And um, when Steam Spy disappeared for a while, I was getting very worried because how would an indie be able to raise money if they couldn't have some data to base their assessment of what their game could do? It's still not perfect, but it, at least we have it, you know, in a, a sufficient level to get some information. Great stuff. Okay, good folks. Good chatting to you all. And uh, please feel free to ping me. And uh, hopefully that was all useful. Thanks all. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate it.